I believe that 2020 will be the year that goes down as what's next? Have you ever thought that about this year? I mean, the way, the way it has begun, you know, the first thing we started worrying about at the end of January and February was of course the pandemic and all the messages that came out from killing millions to killing hundreds to tens of thousands. And so we got used to things like isolation and quarantine and masks and sanitizing and all those things that you and I know so very well. And it just seemed like every week the news was different. Do this, don't do that. You got to do this. You don't have, and it's just like, what is next with this stuff? And then right when we are finally starting to see maybe a glimmer of hope and getting back to normal, well then of course the events of the last few weeks took place. A heinous and brutal and needless killing in Minnesota. And even just the other night in Atlanta, something very similar happened again. And so now we deal with protests and riots and counter protests and the list goes on. You just wonder what is next? And so it seems to have led us to a time of great uncertainty. And so when I think, you know, what is next, you know, in our economy, in our uh, national fabric, in our respect for institutions and history and the problems we have with race and getting along and these kind of things, have you ever just wondered, you know, what is really going on? And so in a time of great uncertainty, I want us to emphasize today things that we can know, things that will give us some stability, things that we can hang on to even in a world that is so filled with all of the doubts and fears and all the problems we face. Sometimes we just need to stop, just need to take a breath, we just need to collect ourselves a little bit and then I believe we can be reminded of some great truths. In times like this it's good to remember how reassuring the Word of God is. Now the Bible says the grass withers, the flower falls off, but the Word of God it abides forever. We know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so no matter how much the world changes all around us, there are things that you and I as Christians can still cling to. There are things that will still bring to us the stability that we need. God has a really great track record. Now, he doesn't stumble or fall. God is not shaken by world events, pandemics, and the list that goes on. Let's go back to about the year 1597. A great philosopher uh, by the name of Francis Bacon gave us a phrase that you probably heard before that simply says, knowledge is power. The more we know, the better off that we can be. And that is why, as a group, as a nation, we invest so much in education. We see the value of a training children through kindergarten and elementary, middle school, high school, and then we encourage them to at least think about maybe a trade school, maybe college, whatever it might be. And we know that when we have knowledge, it just gives us a little bit more foundation. It calms us. It gives us assurance. It offers some hope in a world that doesn't really give that much hope. Knowledge will open some doors for us down the road that would otherwise stay closed. But I want to change that phrase, knowledge is, is power, just a little bit. I might rewrite it this way. Knowledge of God is power. Amen. The more we know about God, the more we learn to trust him, the more we see that God is that rock that cannot be moved, the better off we will be. How much more it is true for Christians to remember that our knowledge of God is going to carry us through the dark times. Jesus put it like this. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Isn't that nice? Isn't that something we need right now? Peace from yes. all the worries. Peace from all the troubles and the <clears throat> sorrow that's out there. He said, in the world you will have peace tribulation. 
But be of good cheer, he said, for I have overcome the world. When we don't know what's going to happen next, we can trust that God does. There's that big word we use that God is omniscient. You ever heard that one? That's a word that simply means God knows everything. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow as well as he knows what happened yesterday. There's nothing that comes as a surprise to God. Jesus said he knows the number of hairs on our head. And for me, that's a shrinking number all the time. And so it's a little bit easier for him to keep up with, I suppose. Uh, he knows what's going to happen in the next election. And so that's not going to come as a surprise to him. God's knowledge is one of those things that brings us comfort and peace. We talk about that peace that passes all understanding. And so today, I want to give us a little bit of encouragement about things we can know. If you have your Bibles handy, we're going to look at 1 John this morning. 1 John chapter 5 and uh, verses 18 down to 21. 1 John 5, 18 to 21, here's what it says. We know. That's just the way he starts out. Here's something that we know, that we can take to the bank, that we can count on. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. I like that. We belong to God. The evil one can't touch us. Verse 19, we know, there it is again, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and gives us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And then he says in verse 21, here's what we have to pay attention to. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. We know, we know, we know. There are some truths about God that we can know that's going to help carry us through these difficult times. And so the question for us is, how can we cope? How do we just go day to day never knowing what the news is going to bring next? Never knowing what the uh, federal government's going to do, the president, the Congress, the courts. Never knowing how the states are going to respond to what is going to happen. How can we cope? When the unexpected happens, we've all had the unexpected. Maybe it's that loss of a job. Maybe it's the loss of a spouse. Maybe it's uh, money issues. Maybe it's problems with our health. We sometimes just don't know what the next corner that we cross or come to is going to bring. How do we cope? How do we cope when life gets hard? How do we cope when Satan attacks us, those temptations that just come day after day? And you never know how he's going to try to get us next, but you know he's going to try. How do we cope when change takes place? These are questions that the whole world has to answer. But as Christians, we have something going for us that they don't have. And so my encouragement to you very simply this morning is this. Hold tight to what you know. Amen. Hold tight to God. Hold tight to being a part of his family. Hold tight to that admonition that we have to defend and keep ourselves from idols. Now more than ever, I would say that we all need God. We all need God in our family. We need that strong, cohesive unit that he will keep us together in these rough and uncertain times. We need to have that relationship with a church, a fellowship of believers who are there to encourage us when we might just want to give up, who is there to be strong when we're really facing some difficulties in our life. In other words, we need to trust him. And so this morning, I want to just bring to us, I think, three lessons that come right from our text today about things that we know. Number one, John says we've been born of God. Isn't it good to know that we're part of the family of God? Remember when Bill Gaither wrote that song so many years ago that says, I'm so glad I'm a part of the 
family of God, joint heirs with Jesus. And so being a part of a family is so necessary. Being a part of God's family is even better. We both, we belong to him as a part of his family. That why, that's why we can call him our heavenly father. That's why we can call one another our brothers and our sisters, being a part of the family of God. We've experienced that new birth. Isn't that what Romans chapter 6 tells us about? We've been raised to walk in newness of life. Isn't that what Jesus says that unless a man is born again, we shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. We need this family relationship with God and we need it with one another. There is strength in family. We've experienced a new birth and what a difference it needs to make in our lives. He says, we know that everyone who is born of God does not sin. You say, wait a minute, that, that, that one might not be true. Because we know that, unfortunately, we are tempted. But you see, as having the Holy Spirit, being a part of the family of God, he is there to help us to grow. And we should be at a place in our life when we can say no uh, to sin a little more than we say yes to sin. That we should be growing in our faith and growing in our dependence on God. It's kind of like the stock market. You know, we just want to keep going up and up and up, right? Getting better and better and better. And sometimes we have those issues. You know, sometimes we fall a little bit, but hopefully we're going on the right way. And that's part of being in the family of God. We need to be born again. We need that spiritual family that's going to be there when the going gets tough. It impacts how we live. And what I mean by that is knowing that I have a family and God helps me day to day. So we are born and a part of the family of God. Secondly, this morning, we know whose side we're on. Now, I, I'm a person who loves the old hymns, and I like to quote the old hymns, but there's one that goes way back, maybe you can work this into the repertoire sometime, <laughs> that says, who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who will be his helpers, other lives to bring? Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? And that's something that we just need to remember. We're on God's side side here and there comes a point where we have to choose our team we have to decide i'm going to be on the side of right i'm going to be on the side of god i'm not going to try to go over to the other side and be a part of the world anymore there's something else about this team that we're on and that is we're on the winning team you know, everyone likes to be on the winning team. They say about the book of Revelation, you'll often hear preachers say, I read the end of the book and God wins. Well, that is true. And we want to be on the winning side. And that just means that we need to make some decisions in our life. It is the one who is in us. Remember, the scriptures say, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? And so when we have to worry about the problems with disease in the world, if God is for us, who can be against us? When we have to worry about the social upheaval that just goes on all around us, if God be for us, who can be against us? John also put it this way, that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And in those times when we're just feeling uncertain, like is it, is it gonna turn out good, is it gonna be bad? Our faith is gonna be what carries us through. We do have to make some choices here. We do have to decide that we're gonna partner on God's side and be a part of his team rather than the world's team. You know, something about the devil is that he has this nasty way of playing dirty, doesn't he? Paul put it this way. He said, Satan is able to disguise himself as an, does anyone remember that? Angel of light. An angel of light. He can take something that's totally bad and make it look good. He can take something that's totally wicked and think, hmm, you know, I might like to try that. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we need to be grounded in the word of God. Why we need to remember that the word of God doesn't change. The things that God was against centuries ago, 
He's still against today, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what you see in the news or the talk shows. If God was against immorality way back then, he remains against and opposed to it today. Satan's schemes, they're out there. We need to have our eyes wide open to them. So we know that we have been born of God. We know whose side we're on. But maybe this last one here from verse number 20 is something that we need to consider again. We know where our strength comes from. Sometimes it's hard to face this mess on our own, right? Sometimes we wonder, what would we do if the doctor says, you got this virus that's going around. How am I going to cope with that? Sometimes we see all the social upheaval that's going on around us. We say, how am I going to respond? What will my personal answer be if I'm ever asked about how I feel or how I've behaved in the past? We need to remember where our strength comes from. It's not going to be on the screen, uh, but in Psalm 121, David put it this way. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? Then he answers his own question. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. When we start to wonder, how am I going to get through? How am I going to make it, whether it's financially? How am I going to make it if we have problems in our families and problems in jobs and so forth? Let's remember what David says. Our help comes from the Lord. God is not only all-knowing. God is also all-powerful. Our help comes from God. And the answers he gives to us are still found, recorded in his word, right? And when we're facing those times of trials, let's be students of the word. We have all that we need to be successful. Well, we say, yeah, I get all that. You haven't really said anything too new today. We've been born of God. This is good to know. We know what side we're on. Yeah, we're all on God's side. We know where our strength comes from. Okay, it comes from the Lord. So now what do we do? When the service is dismissed and we go back home, when we go to work tomorrow or when we uh, interact with people in the neighborhood, whatever it might be, how do we live in light of this? John says, guard yourselves from idols. You say, well, that sounds kind of like Bible times. We don't have shrines to, you know, crazy idols today. But what if we really did? What if we really uh, understood that things that detract our attention from God can be an idol? When we like sports and that kind of stuff more than we care about God, sports has become an idol. When we care more about making money than we do about our relationship with God, this has become an idol. When we care more about entertainment than we do about a relationship with God, that too has become an idol. There may not be people who are worshiping in a church today, but there are people worshiping at the mall, if they're open, worshiping at the department store, if it's open, or worshiping on Amazon.com, because that's always open, oh, right? There, and and so oh, the, the idea is <laughs> things and stuff and money can become an idol to us. In the Old Testament, they put it this way, Exodus 20. Thou shalt have, remember the thou shalt? Yes. No other God before me. No graven image. Idols will do us harm. Make sure it's God first and not the things of the world. Earlier in 1 John, he says, uh, talked about stop loving the world and the things in the world. He talked about the lust of the flesh. You all know what that is, right? He talked about the lust of the eyes. And then he talked about the boastful pride of life. He said, stop loving these things. So there are things that we can know. But I want to end with one other thing that we can know today. And whenever I think about this verse I'm about to share, it reminds me of a man back in Virginia uh, that that I've come to know and love. And and he's one of those guys, uh, the old word was curmudgeon. Uh, He's kind of a cranky old guy. But for some reason, he took a liking to me. And uh, he's, he's just one of those guys, if you saw him, you'd think he was homeless. 
I mean, he, he just dressed just, and his hair was always a mess. He looked like he needed to shave. Years of chewing tobacco, I think, had left him uh, one tooth in his mouth. And you think, you know, th this guy is just, you know, really, you know, really poor. The guy's, the guy's filthy rich. <laughs> the, the guy has a ton of money. Uh, there's another story for another day about that. But he, he is a master builder. <laughs> I mean, he has built homes, you'd like this, over 14,000 square foot that got rolled up in magazines that uh, up on the eastern shore of, uh, uh, of Delaware. And uh, so just, just an amazing guy. And so, but he started coming to the church where I, where I was preaching, and, and most of the time he liked what I was saying, but I must have came across something that he just really took an issue with, and that is this. Uh, I, well, maybe it was he went to a funeral, and, and it wasn't one I preached, but someone preached the funeral, and he said, this dear departed, he is walking the streets of gold. This dearly departed, he is walking with God. He's up in heaven. Man, that set this guy off. How does he know if he's in heaven? I thought, well, maybe he was a Christian. Maybe he lived. You don't know what he did when he wasn't at church. And, and boy, he, he just went off on this kind of thing. And, and his point was basically, you don't really know. And you can't really say uh, only God is going to get there. And so I tried in a very kind way to remind him of this truth. You can know if you are saved. Now, granted, God is one. If you were here last week, we talked about judgment, didn't we? Yeah. Granted, God is the one that's either going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. But I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, and then you can answer this question maybe for yourself. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know. You may know if you have eternal life. Now, I believe it's true. You can fool a lot of people. You're not going to fool God. That's true. A lot of people might think you're the best person that's ever walked the streets, and God might say, no, I don't think so, because, uh, you know, we really don't know what they do all their life. God knows what's in the heart. We need to say that. But let's say that our heart matches our life. And that we've done the things that God has asked us to do about putting our faith in him, about repenting of our sins, about confessing Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior, about having our sins washed away in the waters of Christian baptism and being raised to newness of life, being born again, as he said was the requirement, and being faithful unto death. And so this morning, as you think about things you know, how does that one hit you? Do you know today, without a shadow of a doubt, that if today was your last day on earth, you would indeed go to heaven? The Bible says we can know that. We can have that assurance that if we put Jesus first in our life, if we've done the things he's asked us to do, that we can know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what happens to us today, we have our eternity to be with him. I pray that you have that kind of confidence. I pray that your faith in God is so strong and your obedience to him has matched that faith and you're walking with him in faith that you can know that if today was your last day, you're going to be with the Lord in heaven. Let's go to God and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the confidence that your word gives us. Lord, it's not giving us overconfidence in things that we do ourselves, but rather it's simply trusting in the truth of your word and what Jesus has done for us. Lord, we, we are so thankful that in you we can face the uncertainties of this world. And even though 2020 has been a mess and we don't know what's going to happen in the second part of the year, we know that with you it's going to be okay. And with you, you're going to see us through it. And because we love you, your word tells us that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to purpose. I'm thankful for this chance to share here with these believers. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would be with those who need to make decisions, that they don't have to live in uncertainty, but that they will live in their faith and certain in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.